Hellerian described how his brother's head was split open with an axe, his mother was shot, and he woke up surrounded by corpses. His entire family had almost all disappeared without a trace. This actually happened, he just didn't witness it. In response to the judge's query about why he had initially admitted to having killed Talat, he replied, when did I say that? When pressed, he insisted that he had no plan to kill him and said instead, I do not consider myself guilty because my conscience is clear. I have killed a man, but I am not a murderer, he claimed, acknowledging that about two weeks before the murder, he kept, quote, seeing the scenes of the massacres over and over. I saw my mother's corpse. The corpse just stood up before me and said, you know Talat is here, you know he's here, and yet you do not seem to be concerned. You are no longer my son, unquote. It was then that he decided to kill Talat, he said, but on further interrogation, he also claimed that he had made no such decision and did not even know Talat was in Berlin, and he appeared dazed and confused. This was obviously an act. The district attorney who prosecuted Talarian played it safe, referring to the massacres as killings known to us all and avoiding questions about Talat's relationship with the German army. He echoed the testimony of General Otto Lehmann von Sanders, head of the German military mission in the Ottoman Empire, who, de who declared that the German army was shocked and surprised by the massacres. The general, who had been the object of British criticism for having abetted the murders, worked to counter charges of German complicity by insisting that all the officers up to the rank of general in the eastern provinces were Turks and that, quote, most of the perpetrators were not of a select class of soldiers. They were criminals or the perennially unemployed, unquote. He also claimed that the German government had protested Turkish violence against the Armenians. The prosecutor used von Lehmann's testimony to deflect from Talat's responsibility by portraying the murderers as rogue troops and the murders as an overheated but understandable response to Turkish fears of Armenian betrayal, that is, the fighting for Russia. Although von Lehmann's testimony defended the Germans, it also created sympathy for the defendant, for Telerian, who emerged as a victim of Turkish bloodthirstiness. The prominent defense attorney, Johannes Werthauer, also negated the real ties between, between Talat and Germany by calling to the stand an Armenian bishop who negated the real ties between Talat, uh, I'm sorry, by calling to the stand an Armenian bishop who had survived the genocide. He thanked the Germans for saving him. Testimonies also came from a wide range of eminent doctors, academics, military men, and Armenian witnesses who testified to their own experience with harrowing eyewitness reports. Christine Terzi Bashian from Anatolia described how wealthy Armenians were given advance notice that they were to leave their homes, while the poor were told to gather with little time to spare. Four groups of 500 families from her village were evacuated. This is all, these are all, she is speaking about this. This is one of the first times these testimonies of the Armenian genocide were made public. As they filed out, she said, they began to walk over corpses from other villages. At some point, men were separated from the group tied together and thrown into the river while those who remained were forced to watch. The presiding judge asked her, how do you know that? To which she responded, I saw it with my own eyes. She went on to describe how Turkish gendarmes murdered the remaining men with axes, threw them in the river, and killed women whom they did not kidnap. When the judge asked, is all this really true? You're not imagining it? He was trying to give her a platform. She swore that it was true and even worse than she could relate. The judge then asked who was responsible, and she accused Talat Pasha because the Turkish guards forced some of their victims to kneel and cry, long live the Pasha. Only three members of her family survived. One evidence, once evidence of the atrocities had been established and confirmed by credible authorities, Telerian's lawyers sought to exculpate their client. Werthauer, careful not to cast aspersions on a former German ally so as not to alienate the jury too much, acknowledged that Talat may have been a decent fellow, but called him a member of a, quote, militarist cabinet. And this is a fairly long quotation, but it's very important. A militarist, he said, and this is all quoting now, quote, quoting now, is a person opposed to justice. 
The militarist is not an individual who is a member of the military by calling. It is possible to be an officer or a soldier, wear a uniform, use weapons, and at the same time not be a militarist. The officer or soldier himself can uphold the principles of right and justice and perform his duties as a member of the military at the same time. On the other hand, there are countless militarists who have never put on a uniform. They sit at a desk, write articles, and fiercely defend the flag of brute force. The militarist, now that's the quotation which is quite astonishing given that it's said in 1921. So he's distinguishing essentially soldiers' honor from a special cast of people. The militarists, he said, quote, annihilated the Armenians, unquote. They did not represent the Turkish people. They were not even soldiers. Here again, he made a crucial distinction between legitimate and illegitimate warriors. The militarists were, quote, well-trained animals that will never be able to have human feelings, unquote. They formed, he said, a distinctive new caste capable of deporting a whole nation. In contrast, Werthauer proclaimed, Tellerian was like the Swiss patriot Wilhelm Tell, who had killed a tyrant to save his people. By associating, with Tell, by associating him with Tell, the defense associated the Shooter's Act with heroic, and the, he called it, humanitarianism. As the, uh, uh, and, and he, in so doing, displaced the German army's responsibility for murderous deeds onto Turks he cast as militarists and he realigned German loyalties from the Ottoman Empire to the murdered Armenian nation. The prosecution trial, the prosecution tried but could not convict Tellerian. The trial cast him as an unconventional soldier whose murder of Talat was explained as a response to a militarist enemy. But how could his act be both heroic and driven by temporary insanity? According to the defense's logic, Tellerian was not a conventional hero because he could not have fought back under the circumstances. Rather, as the lawyers portrayed it, he was compelled by human conscience, by the necessity that right and justice must, must triumph no matter what, even at the expense of the avenger's own life and freedom. The trial constituted a new kind of hero battling a seemingly novel type of crime. Bureaucrats without uniforms signed writs decreeing the annihilation of a people. German conservative nationalists, not surprisingly, bemoaned Tellerian's acquittal because it rewarded a man who had murdered a wartime German ally. Even the general public was uncomfortable, if sympathetic, to the verdict because Tellerian had, after all, committed a cold-blooded murder. If the defense's lawyer's strategy <coughs> excuse me, hardly convinced everyone, it accomplished its goal. An Armenian assassin on trial for murder turned the proceedings into a verdict on Armenian suffering and walked out of the courtroom a free man. And historians, to the extent they've written about this trial, which is really only German historians who write about Armenian genocide denial, have argued that this trial was the turning point in which German conservative nationalists turned from denying the genocide to actually saying, yes, it existed, but so what? Right? That this trial was made them uh, need to confront the genocide and, and forced the public to recognize that it had existed and that the Germans probably had been complicit in it. Now I'll turn to the trial of Schwarzbard. So the Schwarzbard case drew many comparisons to Tellerian's. None was more powerful, in fact, than Schwarzbard's defense attorney's proclamation that an Armenian named Tellerian, like his client Schwarzbard, had cried, I am pleased to have done what I did. I've avenged my people. I've killed a butcher. That Tellerian had made no such declaration is beside the point. He actually raised this case in Schwarzbard's trial. Torres insisted that, like Tellerian, Schwarzbard must also be declared not guilty. Audiences understood both trials to be about the inhumane treatment of a minority population with no recourse to the usual tribunals of justice. Schwarzbard's trial highlighted in a public forum the routinized violence to which Ukrainian Jews had long been subjected. As in Tellerian's case, the trial revolved less around Schwarzbard's deed than around the atrocities committed in pogroms and whether the army leader Shimon Petlura had really organized and sanctioned them. The state brought the case against Schwarzbard on behalf of Petlura's widow and brother. The lawyers were seasoned. 
and very famous. When the judge interrogated Schwarzbart at the beginning of the trial, the defendant was defiant and headstrong. Since the prosecution insisted that he was part of a Soviet conspiracy, the judge asked if he had really acted alone. He insisted he had and explained his motive by focusing on the horror of the Ukrainian pogroms. He claimed that a non-Jewish Russian acquaintance in Paris had told him about having overheard officers from the white Russian army, that is the anti-Bolshevik uh, section of the Russian army, talking about their exploits in a hospital waiting room. One claimed that he had raped 37 Jewish women and the other boasted that he had killed 15 Jews in a single day. The acquaintance told Schwarzbard that he was so shaken by the terrible stories that he left without finishing his medical treatment. Schwarzbard told the judge, you can imagine the state that I was in. I was present at pogroms. I saw atrocities committed and I forced myself to forget them. But the Russians who came to, to me, came to tell me these things awakened in me all these memories and that had a huge impact on me. The judge, it was, as was customary, in order to establish the facts of the case, proceeded to describe how Schwarzbard located Petlora in Paris and how he had been killed. At one point, the judge asked, quote, you wanted to avenge your co-religionists who were victims of pogroms in the Ukraine, pogroms or organized, according to you, by Petlura. When Schwarzbard once again replied yes, the judge asked him why he believed that Petlura was responsible for the pogroms. Schwarzbard offered a short history lesson. He was prone to grandstanding. Petlura took Ukraine by force against the Bolsheviks, and the first thing his men did, he said, was to massacre Jews. Calling Petlura's men true brutes, he stated that they surprised people in their homes as they slept, quote, because they knew that the Jewish population had no defense. They shamed women in front of their husbands, daughters in front of their fathers and brothers. They burned and pillaged. They planned pogroms. Pogroms are assassinations, pillage, and rape. Voila, the pogrom. He then claimed that Petlura's soldiers had a slogan on their armbands and hats, quote, kill the Jews and save Ukraine, unquote. Other witness testimony bore out Schwarzbart's claims, not only about the atrocities committed in pogroms, but also about Petlury's responsibility. The prosecutor asked pioneering Jewish historian from Kiev, Elias Churikauer, if Petlura was at least partially responsible for the pogroms. He responded that no one in Ukraine doubted his responsibility and recounted the Jewish community's multiple pleas with Petlura to stop the pogroms to no avail. Quote, the assurances Petlura gave about his opposition to pogroms can be compared to calling the doctor after the sick person dies or to calling the fireman after the fire has already been snuffed out. And now I'll talk about some of the victim testimonies in the trial uh, for a little bit, conclude about both trials, and then try to give you a few points of, of reference so that um, to give you a sense of what one can draw from these trials, I think, about the creation of the cultural meaning of genocide. So the witness, Mademoiselle Grimberg, as she was called, her name was Haya Greenberg, a medical student, testified about a particularly brutal pogrom in 1919. She said that she left her office one evening only to hear savage cries as Ukrainian soldiers approached the Jewish parts of the city. The next afternoon, she went to care for the wounded and found there had been a massacre. The su survivors had lost entire families, including young children, all murdered by soldiers wielding bayonets. A young woman of 19 who witnessed her mother's murder saw the Ukrainians throw themselves on her and cry, quote, this is for our father Petlura, unquote. Greenberg's grandparents, had been turned, grandparents' home had been turned into a hospital. There, she, as a medical student, cared for more wounded children, their mothers, and later a woman with a bullet lodged in her throat who died in Greenberg's arms. She spoke about all of this. Many of them perished, had limbs amputated, or were struck dumb by terror. She claimed that some of Petlora's soldiers stopped by the makeshift ho hospital to express their shame at the senseless murders while others sang and played music in the streets. She testified that the Jewish council of the town, of which her father was a member, went to plead with Petlura to leave them in peace, but he did nothing to stop the pogroms or punish his men. She did not know of an order by Petlura and did not see him herself, but insisted that he was responsible for the atrocities. 
the prosecution called witnesses to prove that claims about Petlura's responsibility were exaggerated or false. These were men who had served in the military with Petlura and civilians who testified to his great affection for the Jewish people. The prosecution set the stage by arguing that in Ukraine and Russia, pogroms were simply a fact of life, and Jews among their many victims. They underlined the chaos of the period during which Germans fought with Ukrainians against the Bolsheviks, and the Ukrainians were split into many groups, some of whom fought with Petlura for Ukrainian independence. In this environment, in which troops of various loyalties battled ferociously, the prosecution witnesses claimed that the Bolsheviks also engaged in pogroms, as did rogue elements of an otherwise honorable Ukrainian military. You can see the similarities between the two stories. A Ukrainian ex-military man proclaimed that he had personally struggled both to prevent the Jewish colonization of Ukraine and to stop the Bolsheviks from creating a Jewish republic. In one of the most dramatic moments of the trial, a former army colonel denied Petlura's responsibility for any massacre. massacres. He stated that he couldn't be responsible because the pogroms against Jews were the work of, quote, divinely inspired revenge, unquote. In other words, uh, these witnesses had not been coached. Uh, and so they, they sort of alienated the jury by these sentiments. Torres, of course, the, the defense attorney for Schwarzbard, made hay of these statements, mocking the reference to divinely inspired revenge and skillfully weaving a narrative about the pogroms into his cross-examinations. He insisted that Petlura had not punished one of his officers until a year and a half after the worst pogrom, underlining testimony that the action demonstrated Petlura's compassion for Jews. When asked if his witness, Haya Greenberg, had not simply relied on public rumors about who was responsible for the pogroms, Torres argued that the violence, or the defense attorney argued the violence was systemic and organized, and in a dig against the rogue troop argument, reminded the court about Greenberg's claim that Petlura's soldiers had cried, this is for our dear father Petlura. And this is very similar, obviously, to the Turkish gendarme who forced their victims to thank the Pasha. His point was that even if Petlura did not participate in deadly pogroms, the murderers invoked his name and presumed his approbation. Torres also deftly compared the civilized values of the French command to the barbarism of Ukrainian troops, turning the rogue troop claim into a characterization of Ukrainian brutality rather than an assertion about a few groups of hooligans. In France, he argued, military promotions were based on merit, while in the Ukraine, uh, army titles were given away as spoils of war. He implied that since the officers testifying likely did what they were told in order to reap rewards, it was hard to imagine that Petlura was ignorant of what his men were doing. Of course, this is using, um, it's, it's within the narrative of the civilizing mission, this, the, and I can talk, I'm going to talk about that. Torres put to rest any questions about Schwarzbart's character by reference to his time as a French soldier. He argued that Schwarzbart had absorbed French honor on the battlefield, refused the passivity of his ancestral race, and demanded justice. Though Schwarzbart, like Tellerian, was a vigilante, in fact, the assassination was treated as a crime of passion. The legal category usually used to acquit enraged husbands or wives who murdered their adulterous spouses. Like Tellerian, his actions were driven by an insatiable passion for justice, as the court reasoned. He had fought back against an army who preyed not upon patriotic enemies, but defenseless civilians, and was dedicated to slaughtering his people, whom, he, whom both sought to avenge. So in conclusion, what, what do we make about all this? Let me just summarize the two cases and then get to the final points. Tellerian and Schwarzbard restored honor, provided a legal resolution in court to shocking crimes for which no one could be held accountable. Lawyers made the suffering witness on the stand the protagonist of the stories rather than the villains. The source of Tellerian and Schwarzbart's conscience, and hence their, hu their humanitarian war on barbarism, was not the courage of the traditional hero. Their acts originated in an injury inflicted by their subjection to powerful memories of violence that overtook their lives. 
Even if they had already endured the worst, their psychological wounds caused such extreme disorientation that under certain circumstances, they might not be in their right mind when they pulled the trigger. The trial narratives pitted these injured men against their enemies. In these stories, Teleriyan and Schwarzbard, disoriented by suffering, confronted the men they killed, while the Turkish militarists and the Ukrainians had low-level troops who did their dirty work. The Armenian and Jewish avenger, avengers had pure humanitarian motives, while the militarists committed calculated, organized crimes of annihilation, or, like the Ukrainians, perpetrated systematic mass atrocities motivated by animus and cruelty. This is obviously a discourse of honor. The righteous avenger's persecution is a wound he can no longer bear. He strikes out to staunch the bleeding. He is a survivor not of war between nations, but, as Raphael Lemkin noted, of national attacks on stateless groups and embodies the traumatic effects of injuries left by the experience of mass victimization for which there was no remedy other than the avenger's own action. The trials imagine, and this, there are many other trials like this, so, a new kind of crime and formed a novel, victim-centered concept of a witness who demands not pity or empathy, but justice. This is very rare. This is completely new. I, I, I can't, I have to emphasize that, though it may not seem to you, it is completely new. So to conclude, there are three points that will bring us back to our understanding of the cultural meaning attributed to genocide. One, the violence, I wanted to, the violence perpetrated against Jews and Armenians is not represented as violence typical of human nature at war or in conquest. Instead, it articulates a new kind of crime perpetrated by a new kind of criminal in which millions of people die because they belong to an ethnic or religious group rather than because they pose a threat to state power. The criminal's violence is not only described as the regrettable barbarism that ostensibly goes along with imperial conquest and war. It is calculated, deliberate, and all the more violent for all that. I'll get to why these illustrations are here. 